Welcome back to Your Story Medicine. Today, I am with Elise Preston. Elise is a healer, coach, and leadership mentor whose work focuses on centering connection as an essential ingredient for healing and social transformation. Her mission is to support leaders, change makers, and visionaries to experience energy healing and self-awareness so that they can cultivate communities, services, and experiences that center radical healing and liberation. The only way that we can begin to heal society is if we do the important work of healing ourselves. And as the founder of Be More Connected, she uses the modalities of yoga, mindfulness, and human design, what, what, to support clients in seeking their purpose, creating community, and living more connected lives. Hi, Elise. (laughs) <laughs> it's so nice to be here with you. Yes, you're like one of my favorite people. I'm so excited to dive into this topic that suddenly like everybody is 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 getting into like astrology. What's that? We don't need that anymore. What Myers Briggs? What we don't need that either. We got human design is everything and and so much more. And yet so grateful that you have chosen this as a pathway to support us in our healing and liberation. So, um, okay, it, well, <laughs> well, I like to ask in your own words, how would you describe your medicine, but also uh, share with us where is it you are currently calling home? Yes, well, I am based in Baltimore, Maryland, mid-Atlantic, and um, the tribes, the people that are indigenous to this land are the Lumbee tribe and the Cherokee tribes. And for me, um, I am really excited about expanding into this space of really blending in um, healing, alignment, and pleasure, because I really love to say that human design is a tool that supports us with knowing ourselves, loving ourselves, trusting ourselves, and being ourselves. And the group of people that I love to support the most are people who identify as healers, change makers, visionaries, folks who are often working themselves, you know, beyond the point where most would. Um, I myself am someone who comes from a background of working in the nonprofit sector and working specifically in youth development organizations. And I experienced um, working within a culture where overwork and burnout and exhaustion were things that were glamorized and that there was often um, this this pressure to always be on and that we were kind of conditioned to live in a way where we thought that to be of service meant that you had to sacrifice yourself and so I am really taking a stand for um, pushing ourselves outside of that box, um, really releasing some of those harmful and um, really detrimental forms of conditioning and leaning into the truth that when we are nourishing ourselves, when we are taking that time to really get in touch with our soul and what we came here to do, we can be of highest service to the planet. Um, And so that's what I'm really excited about diving into in our conversation today. Yes, I as well have a strong background working in nonprofit youth development and the term at risk always annoyed me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I, I saw a post that said, what does at risk really mean? If we were to look at the core of it, it actually means youth who are at risk of adults failing them. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> what message are we also giving to young people if we are martyring ourselves for their well-being? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> and as young people, the things that we say only have, you know, such a uh, minimal impact on how young people are actually receiving the 
um, information that we're transmitting to them. What has the most powerful impact are our actions and what young people see us do. And so they're often absorbing, mirroring, reflecting, taking on the ways that we move through the world, the ways that we operate. And so it's, it's actually pretty harmful if we are moving through, um, you know, working in supporting um, community and particularly working with young people and showing up in the world in a way where we are completely depleted, exhausted, not taking care of ourselves, not respecting our bodies, not feeding ourselves well, um, not taking that care to um, know that our greatest contribution that we have to offer the planet is our energy and our gifts and our presence and our message. And so um, I think it's really important that he just brought that brought that piece to the surface. Well, I know that there's a lot of people listening who may come from a nonprofit background or work with young people or who are in the healing profession. And what I have found, and I'm saying this for myself too, is that a lot of people who choose these fields or, or these careers are people who have their own personal trauma or relationship to, well, Oftentimes people come into these fields because of the healing that they have yet to do with themselves. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> tell us what, what is your ancestral lineage? Tell us about your, your upbringing and how that has influenced the medicine that you have now chosen today. Yes. And so my background, I'm actually biracial. And so my mom, her lineage is a bit German, Czechoslovakian, Polish. Um, my dad is black and I don't have a lot of context around which specific countries in Africa um, his family comes from. But in terms of um, when coming to the US, um, when being forcefully <laughs> um, brought to the US, but um, we do have family that um, is from different regions of the South. So Texas, Louisiana, um, but now both sides of my family have settled in Western Maryland in Hagerstown is the region. And it's um, a rather small town environment. Um, and actually both of my, my parents met in high school and they were, you know, two of the only um, members of their family to actually leave that area in recent generations and go to college and end up um, getting advanced degrees. And so for me, my, my background within my immediate family has been that I've always been kind of navigating being someone who is living in a multiracial, biracial body and growing up in spaces that were um, predominantly white spaces and also having the experience of my, uh, my parents um, navigating being in a world that was a little bit different than where they grew up in terms of um, shifting from being in more of a smaller localized small town environment and moving towards more of an urban environment and being in a city and um, wanting to expose their children to more opportunities, more education, more extracurriculars, more enrichment. Um, and, and me having the experience, I guess, or the contrast of seeing um, what kinds of opportunities I was able to access that were very different from my cousins and other relatives who were um, growing up in that small town environment. And so for me, um, as, as a kid, I often felt as though I was really trying to understand my own um, racial identity, but also my own socioeconomic identity um, 
and moving through multiple different worlds. And for me, I've always been someone who identified as being very um, spiritual, very uh, intuitive, very sensitive, very emotional. <laughs> and I have always felt things very, very deeply. And um, I often didn't understand why I would be treated differently if I went places with my black parent versus went places with my white parent. Um, why I would, you know, be treated differently whether I was wearing my hair curly and natural in a fro or whether I had my hair blow dried and straight ironed and um, was being received in all of these different ways based on the context of the you know, oppressive, um, racialized norms that exist within our society. And so I think for me, growing up, um, just having a lot of questions and grappling with a lot of different aspects of my identity has been really formative to the work that I do now. Um, and also, I, I want to name that for me, I've always felt a little bit like a lone wolf or someone that didn't quite fit in in any of the spaces that I've been in. And so a big part of my business and a big part of my brand is around connection and belonging and really supporting people with loving up on all of the things that make them really, really unique and really individual because those are really our superpowers and our greatest strengths. Um, but often in our society, we've been conditioned to believe that those are the things that we need to hide, that we need to make small, the things that um, we need to push away. And so in all the work that I do with clients one-on-one, -on -one, it's really about supporting people with seeing that they were born inherently worthy and that like our process of healing is not about changing anything about ourselves, but it's really about seeking to become the person that we've always been at like a deep core soul level. And our healing is about really getting ourselves back to our whole authentic worthy selves that we came into the world as. Oh, I can't hear you. So what was the switch for you then after going to school, getting your job in nonprofit, and then suddenly being like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to do this work anymore. I'm going to go and pursue this thing called human design. Did it happen overnight? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. It was, it was a very winding journey, I would say. Um, undergrad was a opportunity for a huge shift and expansion for me because I was able to take anthropology classes and sociology classes and dive deep into a lot of the questions that I was grappling with as a kid growing up in the world in the body that I was in. And it gave me a lot of language and power and understanding to um, really start to own aspects of my identity and also to challenge um, places where harm was being caused. And after college, I decided that I wanted to come back to the Baltimore area. I went to college in DC. Um, and uh, my first job was actually working at a community center in central Baltimore. And I had really a dual experience of on the one hand, um, feeling so grateful for so many of the amazing community members that I had the chance to connect with, um, young people that I had the chance to connect with, had some projects that we worked on that were really amazing, um, but also felt so disappointed and disheartened and frustrated with the structure of the nonprofit organization that I was working with within um, 
the fact that they had essentially an all white board and an all white leadership team that was not connected to community and not prioritizing the needs that were being you know, explicitly communicated and instead prioritizing a whole nother host of things that no one needed and no one was asking for. Um, and so I kind of hopped around <laughs> to a few different nonprofit organizations and found those same themes, you know, replicated again, but just within different organizations and was just kind of at a loss. I see myself as being a very positive, very optimistic person. And I was really kind of getting to the point of apathy where I was like, is there no organization where I can work and feel like I'm in integrity with myself? And that was really a breaking point for me because I just couldn't imagine myself being in like such an apathetic place. And so um, that was actually when I decided that I wanted to start yoga teacher training because, okay, in addition to the apathy, I was also just like burnt out and exhausted and yeah. knew that I needed to be taking better care of myself. And so did they have a, did they have a self-care budget, <laughs> a wellness budget. <laughs> so that's, that's also something that was really important to me too, is like, I was saving some, some cash to be able to, um, invest in self-care, but it was also really great because I was connected with, um, a community member here who was someone that really supported me and helping me to see, to believe that yoga teacher training was possible for me because I just assumed that I would have to pay in full. Like I saw the cost on the website and I thought I'd have to pay in full. And she was like, no, just send them an email, talk to them. Like they'll break it down. You can do month to month payments. Like if this is a program that is a full yes for you, like they'll help you, like they'll make it happen. So I was, oh, cool. I didn't even know that was an option, but now that it is, let's make this work. Um, and that was a really transformational 10 month experience for me because every week, every Thursday night for four hours, I was like surrounded by a community of like-minded leaders who were really investing in their own self-care, but also were community minded and wanted to explore how to share healing with those that they were connected with. And so it was during that 10 month experience that I was going deep into my spiritual exploration, listening to all the podcasts, reading all the books. And that's when I discovered human design and just became completely obsessed. And so at that point, I wasn't even, it wasn't even in my mind, like the thought wasn't even in my mind about turning that into a business. It was just about me getting really deep into my own chart and then being able to look at my siblings charts and my friends charts and share the magic with them. And every single person that I shared it with was blown away by the accuracy of this system um, and just saw it as such a really powerful tool. Um, and so actually my first, um, the first way that I started sharing healing with people was through yoga. And so I started um, just hosting some community yoga classes. And I also started hosting um, some self-care Saturday events at my house and just kind of playing with this idea of gathering people together, mostly gathering women together and centering our own self-care and centering our healing because a lot of the people that I was surrounded by were also people who were working in direct service or working in nonprofit um, careers and really needed some opportunities for self-care. And for me, the shift from you know, working full time in the nonprofit sector to even exploring that this could potentially become a business was through connecting with our mutual friend, Charlotte Nguyen. Yay! <laughs> um, yes. And I had a really powerful conversation with her um, that allowed me to give myself the permission to actually expand the offerings that I was sharing. Um, in you know, a, a community-based way into something that I could actually step into as a career. And so it took a few years of me 
really um, sharing with people in my community and uh, before I invested in a business coach and um, started doing the work of creating a brand around these offerings and stepping more into the healing gifts that I love to share. I was chuckling about the self-care budget because when I was working in nonprofit, I think we had like 50 or hundred dollars set aside per mm -hmm. year for that first dollar I spent for my self-care budget was on a yoga chair, a yoga ball chair, because my back was hurting being in front of the computer so much. And then the second thing I got was an air filter because I was finding that I was having a challenging time breathing in my own home because I'm in Long Beach and our air quality is not the best. But the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because there's been more talk about self-care inside of institutions without actually acknowledging the structures that lead people who are in a place of service to burn out. It's like, okay, well, go outside and get self-care. And then when you've had your spa day or your wellness day, then come back. And it's just this perpetual cycle to where our care is rewarded as a result of us constantly burning out over and over again. And so you are choosing this path to say, you know what, I can, my, my self-care does not have to be mutually exclusive from my service. I can yeah. turn it into a career. <laughs> 100%. And I think that the message that we're often told, like within those organizations and even within the culture at large, like our culture very much rewards productivity yes. and our worth is often like rooted and connected in with our productivity, which is so harmful. Like we are inherently worthy as human beings living on the planet today. Um, but what did I want to say around this piece? Oh, that there's this concept or this idea that we have to work to the point of exhaustion to earn rest and play and pleasure and nourishment. And I want us to completely do away with that um, train of thinking and really start to step into this new paradigm of change for a new generation of change makers who are ready to really step into the truth that they are wholly worthy and deserving of feeling good while doing good and that that is possible for all of us that is wow feel good while doing good yeah because i think especially for women of color who i feel at least for me i've like learned it from my mother to just like give and give and give oftentimes we're pouring from our reserve and considering that the norm or we're martyring ourselves for the sake of a greater cause or even an individual who we feel like oh, we want to take your pain away but it, it's not conducive and mm -hmm. I feel like ever since I was taught about human design which you're the first person I learned this from mm -hmm. it blew open my energetic channels to help me see the patterns of why it is I have been showing up the way that I have. What I love so much about this is that beyond Myers-Briggs, Enneagram, any of these personality tests, it truly is an individual process. And there's people like you who have chosen this path to guide people into embracing what makes them so different versus seeing it as a flaw. And side note, Elise is actually a guest coach in my program where I have her break down all of my clients. That way I know what to look out for in them. It's it's so fun. I'll like pull out my journal and I'll be like, what, 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 is, what is your type again? Oh, this pattern is showing up for you and not just in your business but your personal life as well so for anybody who is new to human design how would you describe it yes so i love to say that 
Human design is a system that supports us with experiencing greater self-love and self-understanding. And it's actually a synthesis. It's a combination of astrology, the Chinese I Ching, the Hindu chakra system, the tree of life in Kabbalah, and then there's a little bit of like quantum physics and quantum mechanics sprinkled in there. And so the system that it's usually closest, um, closest in relation to is astrology. And many people um, who are in this spiritual world that we love and that we're a part of um, have had the experience of, you know, taking your time, date, place of birth and plugging it into a website like Astro Cafe and pulling up your natal birth chart in astrology. Um, but the difference is that your birth chart in astrology is essentially like a snapshot of the sky at the moment that you were born. And so it's giving you lots of information about planetary placements and how those have like a correlation and an impact on your personality. Um, for human design, you're taking those same elements, right? Your time, your place, your date of birth, but what you're getting back, what you're receiving from the human design software and technology is what's called your body graph. And it's a visual representation of all of the energy centers in your body. And it helps you to get a sense of how best to use your energy, how best to tap into your intuition and make decisions, um, how you work well with others, how you work well in teams. It also has some really beautiful languaging around the specific gifts and strengths and qualities and essences that your soul chose in this lifetime in order to achieve your highest potential. And so uh, this system, it really is based in energetics and it's helping us to really root into the fact that we are all carrying with us a really unique vibration and frequency. And through our healing process, we are deconditioning, right? Releasing all of these different layers of things that don't inherently belong to us in order to come back home to ourselves, in order to come back to our own unique, beautiful, powerful frequency so that we're able to radiate out into the world our gifts in the most powerful and authentic way. So clear and concise. So, well, okay, I'm like, I know that I am a manifester. It sounds so fancy. I'm a manifester. <laughs> and so some of the things that I learned from you about my I don't even want to say personality type because it's so much more than that. My energy type? Energy type. Mm -hmm. Yes. My energy type is that as a manifester, I am good at multiple things, but I'm not good at multitasking. So I just need to do one thing at a time, master it before moving on to the next versus a lot of my clients who are manifesting generators, they are great at multitasking. And so uh, can you briefly break down the types and things that people can start to be mindful of when they go and take the test and they're like, okay, now I know who I am. And if I want to talk to Elise, I can dig deeper into <laughs> unpacking this. Yes, absolutely. And so there are five key energy types within the system of human design. When we look at your individual chart, there is a whole plethora of information that goes even deeper than this. With energy types, we're just talking about the biggest and broadest category of your human design. Um, just wanna note that, but knowing your energy type is so, so powerful and so, so important in terms of really just giving yourself a lot of permission and a lot of licensing to own certain things that you may have felt about yourself in the past, but haven't really had the clear languaging to be able to express and embody and understand. And so as June shared, she is a manifester and manifestors are about nine or 10% of the population. And their relationship to energy is really to initiate things. Manifestors are here to be big and bold and visionary. Um, they're here to help us start movements and create momentum in a particular direction. And their strengths are that they're really driven and powerful and influential and impulsive. Um, but for all manifestors, 
their strategy, how they are able to have the most nourishing um, exchange of energy with other people and the world around them is to inform. Because manifestors are so powerful and so influential, the choices that they make and the actions that they take have a really big impact on the other people around them. And so other people really appreciate when manifestors inform and let people know, just give people a heads up about the things that they are intending to do because it helps other people to feel at ease and it helps them to feel included in the movement, in the momentum <laughs> that manifestors are creating at all times when they're acting in the world. Um, manifestors can sometimes experience a lot of resistance and, and pushback from other people if they are not engaging in that process of informing and taking action in ways that it influences other people, but other people haven't been clued in, haven't been given that, that heads up. Um, another energy type, oh, I'm seeing June making a face. <laughs> oh, like she called me on. Well I, well, I think also as I unpacked my own type, it made me realize that I really need to delegate because yes. I, I did everything myself the first two, three years in my business. And it, I, I didn't realize that that control was rooted in my own trauma, my own woundings of wanting to allow somebody else to care for my baby. But then I also learned that I was falling behind on a, lo on a lot of my tasks and my dreams. I mean, nobody's ever behind on their dreams. I just want to affirm that. But as far as creating my ideal timeline, and it has been so liberating to release that because as a quote unquote manifester, if my strength is to ignite and spark inspiration, I know that my weakness is the detail oriented stuff. And so it's actually been healing for me to be able to delegate that. <laughs> yes. Oh, that is such a powerful realization. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because for all manifestors, it is really important to know that the way that you work best in the world is by working in bursts when you have that energy and inspiration and then giving yourself lots of time for rest. And to know that your strength and your energetic contribution is really rooted in being able to initiate and start things and have a big idea and kind of really pushing the envelope and getting us to move in directions that we might not even think to move without a manifestor present. But your strength is not really in the doing. Like you're not designed, you're not designed to be focused in on all of the details and um, making things come into form. You're in that visionary idea space. And that's what we are all really craving from you um, when we're in your energy and when we're in your presence. So being able to really own and honor that about yourself is so powerful and really can transform the way that you, you know, think about your work and your role. So what are you? So I am a projector. And projectors are about 20% of the population. And projectors are known as the seers and the guides. So projectors relationship to energy is that they're able to, they have a very po uh, focused and penetrating aura and they're really able to see into other people and see into systems in order to bring more efficiency um, to help us really like up level and upgrade things. So projectors are really well suited for being coaches and counselors and therapists and guides and our strengths are really around managing and supporting and directing others. Projectors are really insightful and intuitive. And the energy that projectors bring into spaces really just helps to focus energy and support people with accomplishing things. And so for all projectors, their, our strategy um, is to wait for recognition and invitation. And that's because projectors, we often are able to enter spaces or enter conversations with people and receive, you know, these hits of information about, oh, wow, well, if you did it this way, it would be so much more effective and be so much more efficient. Um, we often feel like we have a lot of advice or insight to share with folks. Um, but if we are offering that advice in an unsolicited way where people haven't recognized our seeing gifts or invited us in, it can often come off as 
bossy or pushy or feeling like we know better. Um, or the person may just not have created any space within themselves to really receive that information. So it feels a little bit off-putting. And um, for projectors, even if you're offering it in a heart-centered way with the best intention, um, it can still land for people in a way that is a little bit off. And so to ensure that you have a really beautiful and smooth um, process of sharing your guidance and wisdom, it's so important to make sure that you take that beat to wait for someone to invite you in or to also ask for consent and see if that person would be open to receiving the guidance that you have to share. Um, when I first learned that I was a projector, I remember feeling a little bit bummed because I was like, oh, waiting for an invitation that feels so passive. I don't want to just have to wait around for things to come to me. Um, but I, you know, just through studying and um, learning more about human design, I was really empowered to learn that projectors can actually make invitations come to them faster by really seeing themselves as wise, intuitive, insightful guides and studying up and learning and becoming content area experts in the things that they're most passionate about. Because when you're operating from that space and when you're moving through the world with that energy, that actually allows those aligned invitations to come to you much more quickly. And so I love to share that bit of information with any other projectors that might hear about that strategy and feel a little bit, you know, disappointed. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I know that there's several other types. I mentioned manifesting generator, there's generators, and there's a couple more, which for anybody who is curious about their type, you can learn about it for free. And seriously, book a session with Elise to learn more about your own unique blueprint. But why now? How is it that human design can support us with being rooted in challenging times. Yes. And so I feel so grateful to have been connected in with a system of human design at the time that I was, because I feel like it has offered me so many supportive tools and being able to navigate this really unprecedented and challenging time in a way that you know, it's still challenging. I still have my days, but in a way that is really unique and personalized and supportive for my own energetic needs. And so just to share a little bit about what that means for me, um, as a projector, I now know that I am someone who needs a lot of rest in order to feel restored. Um, and even just being able to make subtle shifts, like taking naps and working with my feet up is something that is really supportive for projectors. And that's something that I may have shamed myself about before. Um, may have told myself that I was lazy or that I was working in a way that was unprofessional. But now I can celebrate myself and say, hey, I know these tools um, are things that are gonna actually allow me to be more energized and sustained during my day. So go for it. Um, also human design gives us a lot of um, really beautiful information about the environments that we work best in, the ways to eat that are most supportive for us. As a projector, I have um, slower digestion and slower lymph. And so instead of eating like three square meals or eating larger meals throughout the day, it's actually really supportive to have projector snacks and to be eating four to five smaller meals throughout the day to keep myself sustained. And I, that's not ever something that I had heard before or knew before. And once I experimented with that within my human design, it feels really, really helpful and really nourishing. Um, and also just being able to root into my authentic code and my soul's purpose. Um, within our human design chart, one of my favorite aspects to talk through with people is their incarnation cross, which is related to the key themes that your soul chose in this lifetime and that are the gifts that you're really here to share and the key the core elements of my incarnation cross are connection and intimacy contribution abundance and spirituality and self-care and so for me i'm able to make sure that i'm including all of those elements in my daily practices and in how i'm showing up in my business and it helps me to feel more 
aligned and on purpose, just being able to tap into that knowing. Mm, Yes. I, I think another incredible thing about human design is that it digs into our body and where the imbalances are showing up. Like for me, apparently I have challenges with my liver because of unresolved anger. I don't know. I'm like, I'm always angry brown girl deep down on the inside, but through this work, I have learned to generate that into something that feels healthier and sustainable. So yeah, that's been an incredible tool. <laughs> there is so much wisdom on the physical and energetic level that is contained within your human design chart. And so for people who are interested in diving in deeper, I do have a, a free five-day human design challenge um, that everyone who signs up for my email list receives as their freebie. And so if you visit bemoreconnected.net, um, you can sign up join the email list and you'll instantly receive that five day human design challenge to your inbox. So you can learn all about your type strategy and authority and human design. Um, and for people who are ready to dive even deeper and learn more about the personalized aspects of your own design, I offer human design readings for folks. You can also sign up for those at bemoreconnected.net. Um, but my favorite way in the world to be able to support change makers is through one-on-one mentorship. And so that is a six month container where I'm able to support you on a weekly basis around deconditioning around some of the um, limiting beliefs and things that you may have picked up throughout the course of your life, being able to root into your own authentic code and unique design and exploring how to work in the world in a way where you are creating change and being able to feel good while doing good. So I'm going to do one more plug in. If any of you are coaches or you have your own programs where you're also curious about why is it some of my clients are showing up in this way. And again, I feel like if we can even bring human design into our businesses, it's going to reveal so much about things that we can let go of and then things that we can start leaning into more based off of our types. And I still have my clients who are raving about your workshop, your presentation. And now they, they know that there's not anything wrong with them. It's just not energetically aligned. It's just not energetically correct. Yeah. So I have one more question as Mm -hmm. a future ancestor in the making What would you say to that Elise who was still discovering what her medicine was? Yes. So I think I might just share a little quote that's really tied into this whole theme that we've been chatting on today. Um, And this comes from another human design reader and another human design expert. Um, Her name is Uh, Karen Curry, Karen Curry Parker. Um, And she says that we are designed, we are designed to feel good when we are being who we are and doing what our soul came here to do. And so I would love to share that guidance with myself because I feel like I spent a lot of time in hustle mode, um, forcing and pressuring myself to operate in ways that didn't feel good to me and thought that that was the way that I would be able to be of highest service and the way that I would be able to experience the most success in the world. But now I know that the truth is actually the opposite of that. (laughs) That when I am leaning into the things that make me feel good, when I am sharing my gifts in a way that feels the easiest and the most effortless, that is actually when I'm honing in on the soul gifts that I came here to share. And that's when I'm able to have the greatest impact and to be of highest service to everyone around me. Mm, Yeah, I think one of the things that surprised me the most stepping into this work is that people are not coming to you based off what it is you know. Mm -hmm. They are coming to you because of how it is you make them feel. So if we are perpetuating this narrative that 
we are not enough or we're not doing enough. And then we're grinding and grinding. And then we, when we show up to be of service to people, we're actually running the risk of perpetuating even more harm. Mm -hmm. And so to do this inner work, to tend to our nervous systems, to cultivate a spiritual practice, oftentimes is the energetic frequency that people are praying for. I want to be in the presence of, of Elise or somebody else who just lets me know that everything is going to be okay. Everything is working in our highest divine favor right. and that we don't have to go about this journey alone. So thank you so much, Elise, for your medicine, for your journey. And I'm excited for us to revisit this conversation a year or two from today to also see how much human design has influenced the evolution of who we're becoming. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm so excited. And I'm so honored to be invited to be a part of this podcast because June, you've been someone who's been so, so supportive for me and such a big source of inspiration in my first year and a half of, you know, stepping into entrepreneurship. And so it's just always so amazing to be able to be in your energy and to be a part of the magic that you're creating. Oh, I received that. Please go and visit Lee's, get a booking. And I will, of course, share those links in the show notes. Mwah.